Welcome all to the Emmanuel Mennonite Church on this beautiful last Sunday of August. In two weeks, we're going to be at Camp Squia, and I've been asked to remind all of us that there will not be a church service happening here, but we'll be meeting at Camp Squia that Sunday, and that service will begin at 10.30. So we have two more Sundays that begin at 10. Today is our final Sunday in a series on the metaphors for God. And our theme today is God is two letters. The pulpit on this Sunday's theme slide shows the Greek alphabet, the Alpha and Omega, and it was crafted by Erwin Cornelson when he was the longtime pastor at the Sherbrooke Mennonite Church. Erwin was uncle to Ermgard, our pianist today, and he was a person who encouraged us to know God as Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, and that God had and has a hope-filled future for God's beloved but struggling church and God's beautiful but bruised creation. And in Jesus Christ, God the Alpha and Omega is with each one of us on our personal journeys. When we know ourselves as beloved, but also when we struggle, we are accompanied from beginning to end by unending love and the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. As we prepare to worship God, please join me in our responsive prayer. I will read the words in italics and ask you to read the bold, dark print. The final line will read in unison. Eternal God, our Alpha and Omega, our beginning and our end, we have gathered in this time and in this place to worship you. We come with aching hearts, praying for good news to comfort us. You who from our mother's arms have blessed us, who know our hearts and hear our prayers, be with us now in this hour of worship. Jesus, help us to make the most of each precious moment, for in your name we have gathered and we pray. Amen. Let us continue to worship by worshiping in song, and I invite you to stand and turn in your blue hymnal actually to number 86. The screen says 85, but number 86. It's the same song, just so you know. <laughs> and please stand if you are able, and let's sing Now Thank We All Our God. <laughs>
turn in your purple hymnal voices together to song number 630. We learned this song a couple of weeks ago. It's a lovely song that names God as everlasting God. Russian now. 
So he had to learn a whole new alphabet the Russian alphabet, and there are 33 letters in the Russian alphabet. And the very last letter is called Ya. Can you say that? Yeah. Ya. This is like our Z. And here's a story that children are told about the Russian alphabet. Ya means me in Russian. So we can now all say a word in Russian. Ya. That's me. So the story goes that Ya insisted on being the very first letter. Me wanted to be right at the front of the alphabet. And guess where they put it? At the end. And that was a reminder, the Russian state said, that the government was the most important. But we're going to hear today that that's just not true. That God is two letters, Alpha and Omega, which are the first and the last letter of the Greek, Koine Greek alphabet. And so God is beginning and God is end. God is with us every step of the way and God is with God's beautiful creation. So even though we hear about wars and we hear about global warming, we hear about many hard things. God has a wonderful future in store. And Pastor Rod's going to tell us about that. And God wants us in on the action. And it's so great to see you all in church today to hear about that and to be a part of that action of mending our world, of being at peace with each other, your brothers and sisters, at school, in our families. I'm going to close with a prayer. Dear God, please be our Alpha and Omega. Help us know that you are with us in good times and hard times and that you are always mending us and mending our world in Jesus Christ. Amen. You guys have been terrific. Malaika, thank you again for your help. Let's head back to our seats now. I did not know that about the German alphabet, that the umlauts count as separate letters. So I learned something today. As we prepare to hear our sermon today about the Alpha and Omega, we are also going to be learning about the new earth, new heaven, uh, the things we have to look forward to, and that's what our next couple of songs focus on. So I invite you to stand and turn in your purple voices together to song number 809, and stand if you are able, and let us sing this song, Sing a New World into Being.
number 551, Beautiful Things. So this is a song that we have sung as a congregation in the past. It looks new because now it's a hymn. We used to sing it as a chorus. So it's that little small miracle that happened when choruses turn into hymns because they get put in a book. <clears throat> so hopefully you'll recognize it as we go. Pay attention to the little italicized things that give you directions about where you go in the song. Thank you for those very hopeful songs. God makes beautiful things in the midst of all that's happening in our world. And we've been encouraged in our bulletin to pray for Rod and Rachel and leadership with the beginning of the new church year. We also have all been hearing news about Pakistan and the flooding happening there and MCC. I know we'll be working to respond and the continued war in so many parts of our world, but especially in the Ukraine and Ethiopia. So we want to move into a time of prayer where we lift these concerns. I want to share as well that Menno Place has been going through a challenging time again with 30 residents of the terrace having COVID again, and one of them is our beloved prayer person here at the church, Sue Keller. And so I said that we would be praying for her and the others this morning. I'm going to invite us as we're praying for that new world coming, that at the end of my prayer, that we move into the Lord's Prayer and pray that together. And we'll say, forgive us, our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Let's pray together. 
Alpha and Omega. We long for this new world we just sang about and that you are creating a world where there will be no more illness, war, division, mourning, injustice, or pain. And all will be renewed and redeemed in Jesus Christ. But till that day, we thank you that we can bring our needs before you in prayer. Today, we pray for healing for all who are ill. And we ask especially for those affected by COVID at the Menno Terrace, including our own Sue Keller. Restore all to health. Give patience and wisdom to the healthcare providers and leadership at Menno Place. We pray for peace and understanding in our congregation, in our families, in our friendships. We pray for reconciliation in our country, especially in our relationship with Indigenous peoples. We pray for an end of wars and violence in our world. We think of the Ukraine and Ethiopia and so many other places, Afghanistan, where people long for peace. Bring healing and renewal to your creation as we pray today for the people of Pakistan who are suffering so deeply the effects of global warming in the floodings happening there. Give us compassionate and generous hearts as we respond. Today we also pray for the beginning of our new church here and for our hardworking pastors Rod and Rachel that they will feel our practical support and our prayers. God of our beginning and our end, we pray that the day when the new heavens and earth will come, when the sound of weeping will give way to delight, when all creation will live in peace. And to this end, we pray together now the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him, who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him, to him who loves us and freed us from his sins and blood, and made us to be a kingdom priest serving God, his Father, to him be glory, a dominium forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and on his account all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Reading from Revelation 21, 1 to 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, 
and the sea was no more. And I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. And then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Good morning. The Bible describes God in many colorful ways. Sometimes God is a shepherd, a king, or a father. Sometimes God is described in awe-inspiring and mysterious ways. I am who I am in Exodus. Other times God is described in rather graphic ways. God is a warrior or as an angry mother bear robbed of her cubs. Sometimes God is described in feminine imagery, a woman searching for a lost coin, or a woman in labor. Still, at times God is described as a rock, a fortress, a shield, and even a high tower. All of these descriptions of God are metaphors, terms or images borrowed from human experience to express something lying beyond human experience. For example, when I say she's a brain, I'm not thinking that she's an actual, physical, complete brain, but rather that she's smart. These are metaphors. In the same way, when we talk of God as shepherd, we do not mean God is a literal shepherd with sheep and a covering and a crook. Rather, shepherd is a metaphor to describe God's loving and caring ways that he leads and guides us. Today, our last metaphor on this series is about two letters. Alpha and Omega. I am the Alpha and Omega, says this voice from heaven in the book of Revelation. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, as we've already noted. And we're familiar with these letters for the most part. Alpha males are the bold and dominant ones in hierarchical relationships. When we talk about Omega, car enthusiasts immediately think of the Chevrolet Omega back in the 90s. Health conscious folks may think of vitamins containing Omega 3. With the arrival of COVID 19, we become even more familiar with these Greek letters. In 2021, the World Health Organization renamed the COVID variants with a Greek letter in order, to avoid, in order to avoid confusion and stigma. And we're currently dealing, I think, with one of the many Omicron variants. I really hope we don't get to the Omega variant. We have a ways to go. When the author of Revelation described God as two letters, the Alpha and Omega, he wasn't thinking of personality traits, character, characteristics, cars, vitamins, 
or even coronaviruses. Rather, he thought of God as the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. And English alphabet, alphabet books do the same thing. The first letter in English alphabet starts with A. I learned A is for apple. And the last page is about something beginning with Z. And most of the books I read always had a picture of a zebra. The alphabet books I read never included pictures of a zit, or a zebu, or a zuchan. If they had, perhaps, my Scrabble game might be better than it is. A is the beginning, Z is the end. Though John wrote the book of Revelation in Greek, he drew his inspiration from the Hebrew Bible, specifically from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah didn't speak or write Greek, but rather Hebrew. And in Isaiah, he quotes God as saying, Thus says the Lord, the King of hosts, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no other God. Why describe God as the first and the last? Briefly, Israel was in crisis. The Babylonian army had destroyed Jerusalem and razed the temple to the ground. Many were killed, and those who survived were sent into Babylonian exile. The nation of Israel was no more. Israel was dead, a crisis of faith. So in the logic of the ancient world, each nation had their own gods. The Babylonians had their god, Marduk, and Israel had their god, Yahweh. Yahweh, in the ancient mind, was housed in the temple. And when the Babylonians destroyed the temple, Israel had to ask, was their God defeated? Had their God abandoned them? And the answer to both of these questions was yes. And so Isaiah came to remind this hopeless people that the Babylonian gods were but human creations who had no power or dominion when compared to the God of Israel. Israel's God, Yahweh, the I am who I am, is the first and the last. This meant Yahweh was there at the beginning of time, creating the heavens and the earth. God is also the last, working in history to take creation towards an end, towards an omega, so what kind of end, what kind of omega did Isaiah envision? Well, here Isaiah uses fantastic poetry to imagine a transformed world of peace and justice and universal harmony. For instance, in Isaiah 11, universal harmony in the animal kingdom is imagined, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. Then in Isaiah 65, a new Jerusalem is imagined as a place of peace, harmony, longevity, shalom. And a final example in Isaiah comes from Isaiah 2, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Here Isaiah imagines a world pervaded with justice and peace, where swords will be turned into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. For nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. We know who controls history, says Isaiah. God was there in the beginning, the Alpha. God is there in the end, Omega. 
God is here right now. And as a result, Isaiah encouraged his hopeless and despairing people, saying, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Isaiah paints this glorious, grandiose future pervaded with God's peace and justice and says that it lies in the distant future, in the days to come. But for Israel, this distant future is to begin now. I'll admit, there are times I feel somewhat hopeless about the future. I feel hopeless about the simmering conflict between Taiwan and China and how that could easily spin into a global conflict. I'll admit I sometimes feel hopeless that nations of the world can somehow come together to reduce climate change. And I'll admit that I feel hopeless about peace in the Ukraine. I also feel hopeless at times that I can do anything about the increasing gap between rich and poor. And at these times, I remind myself that it's not my job to make history turn out right. I'm called to be faithful, to give my allegiance to Jesus Christ, my Lord. So, day to day, I try to live peaceably with my neighbors, encourage reconciliation efforts, advocate on behalf of the poor, and educate myself on the issues of the day. I try to re reduce my carbon footprint through lifestyle choices and the kinds of social movements I support. I try to live simply and share my abundance with others. I try to see the face of Jesus in the people I meet each day, no matter who they are. I sing, I pray, but in my prayers these days, I spend more time listening to God rather than talking. These are just some of the ways I try to live God's future today. The book of Revelation was written to early Christians who faced intense pressure to accommodate to the power and wealth of Rome. The writer encouraged the listeners to live out their faith despite fears and pressures of, to accommodate to the empire. And I think the message of Revelation is very relevant, relevant, relevant for us today as we are also faced with pressure of accommodating to the power and wealth of the empire. And our empire isn't ancient Rome, but rather our capitalist society, which is rooted in greed. And we participate in this system without giving it too much thought. We skip over Jesus' warning in Luke, watch out, be on guard against greed. We tend to ignore Jesus' warnings about money, wealth, and its corrupting influences. Instead, we focus on human sexuality. But it matters. It matters a lot how we follow Jesus in our complex social and political structures. Revelation is really a political book. It wasn't written for those whose only concern was getting his or her, her soul away from earth to heaven. Revelation was written to struggling Christian communities who had to come to terms with hard political and social re realities. How were they going to live under the lordship of Christ when the emperor demanded that they worship him as Lord? A clash of loyalties occupy this book, which has among its primary images of throne, kingdom, power. But it concludes with this vision of a new heaven and a new earth or a redeemed city 
not a picture of isolated individuals on solitary clouds. And that clash of loyalties is also revelant, revelant for us. Even though we are here in Canada, are not nearly as politically divided or polarized as folks are south of the border. There is still a lot of spillover into our society. It's shocking to see how journalists and political leaders are threatened with violence. How our political debate debate is reduced to name calling and threats. Christians aren't immune to the spirit that's moving in our society. In fact, Christians today are more apt to identify with a political perspective than they are with their fellow believers. So in the book of Revelation, John paints a picture of a cosmic battle between God and the forces of sin, evil, and death, culminating in a transformed world where pain is no more and death is no more. Like Isaiah, John poetically paints this world of peace and harmony and healing, a world set right, creation restored, God's reign come fully on earth, the Omega. So we know the Omega, friends. Unfortunately, far too many Christians have been hoodwinked by books from Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth, and Tim LaHaye's Left Behind series of books. These books really aren't interested in God creating a new heaven and a new earth. Rather, these books take delight in the destruction of the world. They take delight in the death of millions at the Battle of Armageddon. And they teach how individual Christian souls will be raptured out of this earth to heaven. And these teachings are about as contrary to the gospel as I can imagine. And there's a whole generation of Christians worldwide who are praying and pushing for policies so that Armageddon will come quickly. They believe that when Armageddon comes, Christians will be raptured up to heaven away from the earth God calls good. God must just cry. This cosmic battle in the book of Revelation isn't about some future event. Rather, it's really about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus came into the world not to save souls for heaven, but to change history. The resurrection is a concrete sign of the direction God is taking all of creation and history. We know the future, the Omega. The future is in God's hands. God will bring about a new heaven and a new earth. So how do we speak of this new world? We live in a prose world of facts, figures, and government press releases. We lack the poetry. We lack the biblical imagination to speak of a new world. So let's let John help us. God is two letters. God lovingly created the world and always remains sovereign over it. At the Omega, God will ultimately heal this groaning creation and resurrect human bodies to enjoy fullness of life in a renewed, transformed creation. The vision of Revelation is a great victory celebration of ev- over evil and death. And do we know who won? The book of Revelation says the Lamb won. This small, frail, vulnerable Lamb who is no match for the powers of death and destruction. Those powers thought they had ended the life of the Lamb on the cross. But no, here at the end, the Omega, the Lamb is enthroned in a great victory celebration. 
So here is a vision, not of disembodied souls in the clouds, but a vision of God's world transformed. Here God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. The Omega is where we are headed, towards that place, that time, when God's will will be fully done on earth. So we already know the Omega, and it makes a great deal of difference when we're struggling day in, day out, to know how the story ends. The present pain is real, but knowing the last act, the Omega, the pain is more bearable, hopeful. Perhaps that's why the book of Revelation is the last book in our Bible. Perhaps that's why John describes God and Christ as two letters, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The picture that Revelation points us is more than just wishful thinking. It is a realistic world, a world still being born, a world yet unfinished. The picture painted is poetic, but it's still realistic. Here's the reality of the world, not yet known in its fullness. But having a glimpse of it, a foretaste, a peek into the future, the veil uncovered briefly, is enough to keep us going, enough to keep us walking the faithful path of discipleship. On August 28, 1963, 59 years ago today, Martin Luther King delivered his most famous speech, I Have a Dream, to over 250,000 civil rights supporters in Washington, D.C. And in that speech, King dreamt that his four children would one day live in a nation where they would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Fast forward to today, when we still judge people according to the color of their skin. Someone once said the most segregated hour in the United States is Sunday morning, when Christians go to church. So yeah, we have a lot of work to do, important work to do, to implement Paul's teachings in Galatians 3. In Christ, there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. Another metaphor I talked about is wearing God. When we wear God, God changes the way we see and treat others. So was King's dream, just wishful thinking, fanciful speech, or nothing more? No. His speech talked about a new world breaking into the old, present, yet certainly not totally here. He gave people a dream to keep them moving, words to give hope, words that spoke about the inbreaking light, words which described God's world. And that's the way we are. We need to know the Omega, catch a glimpse of what the future will look like so that we can walk in the light today, carry on in hope with the work God calls us to do. And that's what the metaphor, God is two letters, does for us. Despite all evidence to the contrary, our faith and experience assures us that God is here. God will be at the end. We can live in hope. Patience and endurance allow us to hang in there. The metaphor reminds us that God will bring about a new heaven and a new earth. Thanks be to God.
In response to what we have heard, I invite you to stand and turn in voices together to number 377. 377, new earth, heavens new. Please stand if you are able and let us sing together. here we go with God the Alpha and Omega who invites us into God's future where God makes all things new in Jesus Christ go in peace to love and serve the Lord amen <laughs>